This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit, the free online repair manual for everything. Before you start your next build or fix, head over to ifixit.com slash twit to snag the fully loaded ProTech Toolkit for only $59.95. And check out their array of high-quality parts, tools, and guides. Today on Know How, PGP and cleaning out your PC. Welcome to Know How. This is the show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm your host, Brian Burnett. And I'm Nathan Olivares Giles. And today we are going to show you, well, what PGP is and why you should clean out your PC. Uh, but before we get to that, that knowledge bomb that we'll be dropping on the audience, <laughs> I would just like to thank our TD, the one and only Burke McQuinn, for uh, helping us out today to do this episode. You know him, you love him from Burke Chat, <laughs> and now he's here rocking with us. You can chime in if you want, Burke, if you feel comfortable. Nothing. No. Nope. Nope. Well, see, this is the thing. <laughs> Burke Chat happens on cards. I, so true. I don't know if Burke's voice has ever been on Twitch show. Do you know? Uh, has that ever happened? Only as like a distant yelling, like in the background. <laughs> like, Just a rah, 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 rah in the background? Like, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. Well, <laughs> well, nonetheless, trust us. Burke is back there, whether you believe it or not. Burke's there. <laughs> Take a word for it. Take a word yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, I guess we should get into it. Uh, so we were going back and forth about this project. Yeah. Um, PGP, which yes. stands for Pretty Good Protection. Pretty right? Good Privacy. Oh, Pretty, pretty Good, good privacy. privacy. Okay. So it's basically like an open encryption standard, and it's set up uh, uh, for people to be able to send correspondence back and forth uh, that is encrypted. Now, mm -hmm. the way that it works... Basically, let's break this down. It, a lot of different services and apps use encryption. Right. Google uses encryption for your Gmail messages while they're in transit. Right. But it decrypts those messages while it's on their servers so that they can figure out you know, what you're talking about, so they can target ads to you, so they can mm -hmm. offer you know, services like predictive responses in Gmail, so right. they can offer you know, uh, a conversation that you can have with its, uh, uh, their, their assistant in their chat apps. Yeah, one of the things that I do appreciate of that system is if yeah. I order something on Amazon, then mm -hmm. I'll get push notifications that your order has shipped exactly. that, through like, the Google Now assistant stuff. Yeah, there are other, there are other you know, different companies have different takes on this. Apple encrypts all of their message in iMessage, mm -hmm. so it's never decrypted, so Apple never sees what you have, unlike Google. There's different uh, varying levels of privacy. WhatsApp has uh, 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 full encryption. Right, we talked about standard. Signal a yeah, few episodes back. Signal as back. well. Yeah. So Signal and WhatsApp use the same um, encryption technology, and that's open sourced as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you might want to go with an open sourced encryption technology is because basically the entire world has access to how it works, and right. they are continually trying to break it and make it better. So it's kind of a group project with the entire planet, so to speak. Whereas something like IMAS, uh, iMessage uses Apple's proprietary encryption technology, and that's their own thing. So there's, right. diff there's different approaches to these things. Neither, you know, you can't really say, oh, this one's better than that one or whatever, but mm -hmm. just kind of know what you're getting into. Now, yeah. all that being said, why would you want to use something like PGP? The reason why you might want to say, send private correspondence through PGP versus iMessage or versus WhatsApp or versus you know something else that offers what's called end-to-end -end encryption, so it's encrypted along the entire way mm -hmm. and not visible to the service provider, um, is for an even, even greater level of privacy. So uh, if you and I are you know, conversing back and forth in a service that is encrypted end-to-end, -end, we still know who each other are, we can still identify one another, you know, we can screenshot stuff. There's still ways to trace that back. Mm -hmm. Um, what PGP offers basically is an opportunity for me to create basically um, a, what are called a set of keys so that uh, I can, you know, anyone in the world can send me a private message encrypted with their keys and only those two people can, if they have each other's 
encryption keys right. can see the message that's being sent back and forth. The benefit of this is say that you know maybe I'm living in a country with an impressive government and I want to get some some information out there. Maybe I'm working on a company and they're doing or or a government agency and they're doing bad things, mm -hmm. and I want to share that with. Um, you know, regulators or journalists or, you know, whatever it might be, whatever the situation is, or maybe you just really care about your privacy and you're yeah. still corresponding with friends. Um, nonetheless, I can say create an account uh, tied to like an email address that isn't tied to my name. I can use a fake name. I can do all those things. I can identify myself or not. It's basically fully up to you how much you identify yourself or not in this process. Um, you can also... Uh, and we'll go through this process. You can also set some of these things to expire after a while, like the, the privacy settings and the PGP keys uh, and all these things. A lot of journalists have PGP keys set up so that people can message them confidentially as well. Mm -hmm. So that's basically kind of the justification. Is, is It's one of the most secure and private ways to correspond, whether you want to be known or not. Right, and as... As uh, available as a lot of the apps that we use, like Signal and, yeah. uh, and like iMessage or whatever that you can use, email is still the most basic, easy access way to send information yeah. to somebody yep. without like a lot. You don't have to have a phone. You just have to have access to a computer. Yeah. Um, which in a lot of places, you know, that might be your only way of connecting on the internet. Exactly. Email is still kind of email won't die as much as people might want it to. As much yeah. as people might want it to go away or circumvent it, mm -hmm. it's still so core to so much. Of of what we do on the internet, especially in business capacities, especially in educational institutions, and especially in government, all these different places that really, really matter to how our world works. Now, that being said, a lot of people haven't embraced BG PGP because it's kind of tough to set up. Right. You have to basically like create this set of keys and it's intimidating and what does that mean and how do I share that with people and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of our uh, producers here, Jerry, uh, he actually uh, clued me into a, a Chrome extension that I'm kind of sad to say I didn't know about previously, <laughs> but it's quite popular. It's called Mailvelope um, and it's actually a Google Chrome extension. and tried a few different services in PGP. I've spoken with some friends uh, who are reporters and are encryption experts. And uh, Mailvelope is the easiest tool that I've seen so far to set this up and to use it. OK, cool. Well, let's take a look and see how it works. Yeah, so let me walk you guys through this. So basically, if you go, if you're using the Chrome web browser, which is the most popular web browser out there, so you, you very likely already are, but if you're not, this might be a good reason to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, you add the Mailvelope extension inside of the Google Chrome Web Store, and uh, it's spelled Mailvelope. Mailvelope, so pretty straightforward, yeah. Pretty straightforward. So you add the extension, and then once you do that, I've already actually created a couple keys and I've added some people here. So the first thing you want to do is generate your PGP keys. So you can kind of think of this as an address. If I share my PGP key to you personally, or maybe I put it on my Twitter account so it's public and anyone can message me, right. that basically gives people, if they're using a, um, encryption, a PGP uh, message, a place to send it. And if they're using PGP and I'm using it, it'll get routed to me. Okay. It, I'll be the only one who can decrypt that because I have a corresponding second set of keys that I only have access to. Okay, and you're not limited to just having one key. Like you yeah, can you, can, you can have multiple. Actually, we'll look for Leo in this service ma <laughs> mail envelope. He has like a dozen of them set up, which is pretty great. But um, yeah, you can, you can set this up. You can set however many you'd like. Okay. But basically, it's a public address so people can route stuff to you, but, but it doesn't mean that people will have access to it because it's only one half of the equation. Okay. I have my private key on the other side to decrypt the message. So the first public key that gets sent out to everybody, if you want it to be shared on social networks, whatever, you want to add it into your email uh, uh, signature, you can do these sorts of things, then that's just a routing address, so to speak. Okay. That other second side is basically me opening my own mailbox and bringing it into my home or whatever, if you want to use that analogy and take right. it another step further. Um, that being said, it's, pro it's password protected because these, are, these keys are just kind of numbers and letters and it's not easy to remember. So right. When you create these things, you're going to have to remember what your password is <laughs> or else you won't have access to it. And if you ever want to revoke access to that key and you don't have your password, you're pretty much SOL. You're, okay. It's like not going to happen. <laughs> um, so, so it's pretty important to remember that. Um, and just like with any other password, we've spoken about this in a lot of other episodes. And, and I know Padre and Leo and everyone's kind of hit, hit these notes. But don't make your password to this the same as all of your other services, make right. sure you have unique and specific passwords because, you know, if your password to this is the same as, you know, like Gmail, Facebook, 
iTunes, every single other thing you have, Amazon, whatever. But that's already a bad practice. Bad practice. Yeah. You're gonna you're, you're asking for someone to take advantage right. of, of of your I uh, guess you, your bad choice. You there. could use a password manager, generate a password, and then just save it in that. Right? That could be an option as well. That could okay. be an option as well. And and we do advocate uh, here overall for the use of password managers and and kind of recommend that uh, if you, if you want to give that a shot. So so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually set up. I I created a uh, email account called twittest007 <laughs> at outlook.com and uh, I'm going to create a PGP key associated with this email account. So that's uh, Microsoft Outlook that's not encrypted end to end. They mm -hmm. serve ads in there and all these sorts of things. So the first thing I'll do since it's 007, I'll put my name down as James Bond. Obviously my <laughs> name is not James Bond. I'm not that cool but nonetheless there it is. This is a good example. Yeah, yeah, and I'll put down my email address as twittest007 at outlook.com. And I'm going to click this advanced button here. I'm going to set this, uh, this PGP key to expire, let's do it um, like next Monday, okay. uh, so to speak. So it's going to be short term. I'm not going to have this last forever. If you don't want to have an expiration date, if you're, you say, hey, you know what? I want to have one PGP key for the rest of my life. Yeah. That's cool. That totally works. But if you want to use something temporary, let's say maybe you're in one of those situations where you are sharing sensitive information, mm -hmm. it might be something that could put you at risk professionally, even put you at risk for your life. You might not want these things to exist forever. Right. That's totally fine. Or maybe you just don't want the hassle of having to remember that password all the time. Yeah. That totally works too. Whatever your reason, decide whether or not it's um, temporary for you it's or not. Like the Snapchat version of like an email. Like, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, there's a lot of things to like expiration here. on it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you're going to, like I said, you're going to need to create a password that you can remember that is secure for your access to that second key that is just yours to decrypt any messages you get sent, right? Okay, that makes sense. So uh, I created the password here and I am checking this box to upload my public key to the Mailvelope key server. Um, this is something you can undo or you can delete at any moment that you want. Uh, you don't have to do this, but, but, but basically what that does is it uploads your public key, not mm -hmm. the one that you have pa that's password protected, but the one that is my routing address that can get anyone to send me an encrypted message mm -hmm. using this um, technology. Um, that can be uploaded to a public server. Now, there are a few different public servers, and these services tie into other public servers. So there's some at MIT and all these things. Okay. But this, again, this is a shared community. It's open source stuff. It's, it's kind of like a shared build community thing. So if you want people to find you, let's say uh, you know, you're, you're a journalist or maybe you have a lot of friends who are doing these sorts of things mm -hmm. or whatever, the, whatever your reason might be to have a public key, you want people to find you to send you things confidentially, right. um, then this is a good idea do, to do. If you're on that other side and you don't want people to know that you have a public key out there, mm -hmm. you can keep that secret. Again, you can use your real name or not. I'm using James Bond. Clearly, my name is not James Bond. <laughs> so when people go and search for this in James Bond, yeah. for the next three days, they'll be able to find it. Right. But if not, um, after that point, it'll disappear. Cool. Okay. So I've got that all set up. I've got my email address in there. I've got my, my name. This time it's fake. Mr. Bond. Um, I've got my expiration date set. I've got my password and it matches. And so now I'm going to generate these keys. So as you can see, the key generation is happening. It might take a little while depending on you know all sorts of different factors, uh, uh, internet connection and, and, and how, their, how their servers on their end are working. Mm -hmm. um, but do you expect me to generate a key? No, yeah. I expect you to die. All right, yes, uh, and hopefully not during the episode. <laughs> yeah, no. After we get this one <laughs> yeah, done. Yeah, when we're done, yeah. Yeah, so it says here, success, new key generated and imported into key rings. So that a key has been generated. Now what I'll do is I will show you, I'll go to display keys here, and you can see different things. I created the other day a one by the name of Peter Parker tied to my work twit <laughs> email address, Nathan at twit.tv. Uh, now we have my James Bond joint here, and I was corresponding with Jerry, um, and you can see that there as well. So now I have my keys, and I say, okay, great, I've got my stuff. Now I actually want to send an encrypted message, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so once you have that set up with this extension, this is one of the reasons why this extension is so great and makes it so easy, is... Um, 
All right, so the next thing you want to do is write an email and you want to encrypt that email with your PGP key using uh, the Mailvelope extension. So okay. uh, I'm going into my Outlook account that I've set up to specifically test this thing. Um, don't email this uh, address because I won't answer, but nonetheless, I'm setting this up, I'm just going to I'll send it to Jerry. I'll say, Jerry, this is a PGP test. Neat. Um, and with the extension in place, one of the great things is when you go to your message, uh, you see this little pop-up here. You see this like little ah, notepad? Yeah. Well, you click that, and then that opens up a new message. And I say, okay, here is my message. That looks good. I'm going to send that to Jerry, cool. who have already added his key. I've searched for that, and I'll show you how to do that after this. Okay. And now I want to say encrypt. And so you can but, see this all looks like go gobbledygook, right? Yeah. I just wrote it in there. You know, hey Jerry, this is a PGP test, Nate. And now it looks, now it's, what is that? I can't read that. Well, what yeah. that is, is that is basically the encrypted version of my message. Okay. And, and so then you just send that? Exactly. If anybody were to intercept this, if someone hacked into my account, they wouldn't be able to read this because it's encrypted. So right. if they got a hold of this, they wouldn't be able to tell what it is or anything like that, who <laughs> it's from, all these sorts of things. So then I set, hit send, and that will send this message. Uh, out to Jerry. Cool. Actually, let me put that in here. So, and then Jerry would have the extension on his laptop so that he could then use that to decrypt it? Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Envelope. Yeah, so I send this message and then it gets sent uh, to Jerry and Jerry won't be able to read it unless he has my public PGP key. Okay. So he can, you know, he sees my email address and he says, okay, you know, uh, uh, who's that? Yeah. And he can search for my email address. Uh, if I shared it publicly, he'd be able to find it and add me and then decrypt it. Okay. Uh, and if not, then I would have to send it to him directly. So let me show you how to find someone on this service. Basically, in Mailvelope, you go to the Import Keys tab over here. And then you look for someone either by their name or their email address or by what's called a key ID, which sometimes people will share on there as well. It's not the full PGP key, but it's a way to find people. And you might right. see that. You might see PGP colon, and then it's kind of like a maybe like a dozen numbers and letters or something. Yeah. That's what that key ID is. Okay, okay. So let's look for Leo. So we'll look for Leo Laporte, and we'll search that. And then as you can see, Leo has a lot of PGP <laughs> keys set up well, here. Could this be other people who have the same name too? But I mean, it's probably our Leo. Yeah, but. theoretically, there could be multiple Leos out there. I actually talked with Leo about this already, and he told yeah. me he had something like 12 to 15 different keys set up. Um, like Leo. Yeah, so it just kind of depends. And then uh, what you do is you click uh, one of those blue links, and then it's, it shows you their PGP key here. So, so all this garbled up text, that's the actual PGP key. Wow. And then you see this blue key here that pops up. I got my green little plus button. I hit it. And then that oh. has imported that key from Leo into uh, the Mailvelope extension for me. Okay. So now we go back to display keys. And I see all these different options here. I see here's Leo Laporte. I see Jerry Wagley. I see my, uh, my James Bond account. I see my Peter Parker account. Okay. So that's a way to find someone. Again, this is stuff that's shared publicly out there. Right. And I'm put, not, not sharing anything Leo doesn't want to see because he publicly allowed uh, that information to be out there. Anyone can go and find that. Hmm. But now if I want to send private correspondence to Jerry or to Leo or to my other account, uh, I can do the, that uh, using this app. Now, let's say that I get a, a message uh, uh, from someone that maybe I don't know or maybe someone that I do. So I got uh, Anthony, who's one of our producers here. He sent me uh, a message using PGP, and then he added uh, his key ID into the signature of his email address. Okay. The reason why he would do that, and this is the key ID again, is, is is just a way to find his public key, yeah. not sharing anything private that's, that's private to him, is basically if he sends me this message or to anyone else and it's encrypted with PGP, it allows them to basically decrypt it without having to say, hey, Anthony, I saw you sent me that. It's encrypted yeah. with PGP. Like, what's your public key, right? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, so this extension is smart enough to know that Anthony sent that to me and it recognizes that in the signature of that email, mm -hmm. his key ID is there. So it went out, it got his public key, and now it will decrypt it for me. So you see here on, on my screen, it shows up this little envelope with like the little wax stamp in the back to kind of keep things sealed. Yeah. Uh, I tap that, and then it, <laughs> and then. And now the seal has been broken. The seal's been broken. 
it's unencrypted for me to see. Okay. I'm the only one who can see it because of that decryption. And it says here, signed with an unknown key. It's like, well, you haven't added Anthony to your key list. I see. You want to do that or not, but basically it allows me to get access to that because Anthony gave me all the pieces I need. He okay. gave me access to his public key. Right. He gave me his message and Mailvelope does the rest. Okay, okay. So the, the whole... You know, I guess payload or the the file yeah. that got sent to you has been encrypted, and then you're decrypting it on your end because of the information that Anthony sent along. Yep, you okay. got it. Okay, yeah. cool. So, so again, you know, there are a lot of different options out there to use PGP. Um, there are some Mac apps, there's some Windows apps, there's yeah. like online services. Um, this is the one that I found that has been the easiest. In fact, I've tried to set stuff up early this week. I actually <laughs> generated some keys and was unable to figure out like why I was getting it wrong. This is literally the easiest thing that I've found. It's really fantastic and highly recommended if you're trying to, to use this. So okay. um, that's mail envelope. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to like set up more keys, if you want to import more keys, it's super easy. You just go back to um, mail envelope and you can hit setup. You can do all those things. Um, and then it also allows you to encrypt attachments as well. So let's say I want to send a message, but I also want to send a photo or I right. want to send a map or I want to send a PDF of a public document or okay. whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, then you can do that here and you can encrypt that file and not just text as well. Now, again, you know, huh. we're talking about it in all sorts of different social and technology contexts. It might just be friends talking with one another and you want to keep that private, but it might be that situation where it's vital information um, social good, you know, life or death sort of situations. Right. And so you might actually need a PDF or some sort of proof or some sort of photo or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. This allows you to do that as well. So whatever you, you are trying to share, whatever it is that you need to do, uh, Mail Envelope uh, is pretty flexible in, in, in those ways. Now, there are other apps that will do more. There are other apps that might be more capable, but this one is by far the easiest to use. And if you're trying, right. to, trying to share something quick and easily, um, uh, mail envelope's great. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a great way of getting into it. And then if you feel like PGP is the way that you want to continue sending email, maybe you can figure out other ways that are a little bit higher level or something. But like, I don't use PGP. I should. My understanding of email is that if you send anything out, generally it's it's like the postcard of, yeah. of the internet. It's you know? free, yeah. Like if you sent a postcard in in real life, there is a you know, chance that somebody will look at that and be yeah. able to read it because there's nothing hiding it. Exactly. It's not in an envelope. Exactly. So. Yeah, the way to think about that, postcard's a great analogy. Basically, whether it's a text message or an email, you're sending little packets of data out you know, over someone else's pipes or someone else's wireless network or whatever. And there's lots of opportunities along the way to intercept that data and then, you know, look into it, read it, see what it see what it's doing. These are real situations. I mean, you know, we, we, we've heard so much over the last few years, all the Snowden disclosures and all this stuff on different government agencies uh, looking at things. And, you know, sometimes there are genuine reasons for that. Sometimes it's straight up snoopy and in invasive and, and not right. so great. Whatever your reason for using um, uh, encryption or wanting privacy, uh, that's up to you, but here is a great option to, like you said, try it out, get familiar with it, see if it's for you, mm -hmm. and then if you want to take that next step, you can go further and, and all those sorts of things. But um, it's it's uh, I think it's the place to, to start if you want to use uh, PGP. Awesome. No, I yeah. think that's a, a great introductory to it, and now I, I kind of have a better grasp of how it works. So thanks for, so thanks for bringing that on. Yeah, definitely. My cool. pleasure. Well, before we get to how you should clean out your filthy, filthy PC, we're going to take a break for these messages. We'll be back with more know-how in a moment. But before we uh, do, can I remind you about our sponsor, iFixit? We love iFixit. I, I personally love iFixit. I've known Kyle Weens and his team for years. Uh, they started, really, uh, to be the repair manual for everything. And they've been tearing down. You know, you see there's teardowns, right? Anytime something new comes out, the new iPhone, a new tablet, they take it apart, figure out what's in it, create a video so you can see, a website so you can see, create a repair manual. And in some cases, companies don't offer repair manuals to us, so we have to do it ourselves. iFixit does a great job. They'll even provide parts and tools, and I love them. If you are looking for a gift for the geek in your life, Check out the ProTech Toolkit, and maybe the geek in your life is you. We have three, because <laughs> I keep putting them somewhere, so I want to have enough in the house so you can always find one. They are so awesome. Um, the iFixit ProTech Toolkit 
is only $59.95. It's very affordable. It's got both beauty and brawn, high-quality steel bits, tools tough enough to handle any repair or mod you throw at them. And it has all the hard-to-find bits, and, and that's really awesome. Because there's always, you know, nowadays all the electronics companies, they don't use standard Phillips screws or flatheads. They got, always got something special going on, the pentalobes or the Torx or whatever. You get them all with the iFixit. It's got a Protec tool. It's 64 bits. The 64-bit driver kit has bits for any kind of, like, let me show you, any kind of DIY repair. You get all the bits you need for just about any DIY repair. You get a protective case that keeps it all organized. If, and by the way, it's magnetized, so you can open up, flip it over. The bits don't fall out. In fact, it's held in place by a magnetic mat that is perfect to double as a place to hold the little screws and components. See that mat? It's very handy. You also get, besides the bits, the swivel top magnetic precision driver. You just slot those bits right into it. Boom. They're held by magnets, so there's no tightening or anything. You just put them in. You get a flex extension, which is also magnetic, and that lets you get around corners to hard-to-reach screws. You get the spudger. See the, the plastic opening tools, the picks, safely poke and pry with. You even get a suction cup with a fancy new handle. That's great for removing display assemblies. I fix its own rubber handle Jimmy Pry tool and a set of metal, metal spudgers and the ASD safe tweezers. See those? Those are so handy. And a safety strap, because you don't want to zap your electronics. ESD safety strap in the kit as well. iFixit tools are backed by iFixit's lifetime warranty. You don't need to buy something to get their free repair resources. They're always there. 25,000 free repair guides at iFixit.com. But give them a little thank you. See that? Did you love that? Did you see that? The suction cup? That's awesome. Give them a little thank you by picking up the ProTech toolkit. In fact, get several. Because I tell you what, they're a great gift for the geeks in your life. We gave them to our hosts last Christmas. I fix it, and they loved them. Ifixit.com slash twit. Get the fully loaded ProTech Toolkit, just $59.95 from Ifixit.com slash twit. And we thank Ifixit for their support of our show. And we're back. So, Nate, uh, this is something that uh, it's kind of one of my OCD habits to yep. check on my PC at least once a year because, you know, if a PC is just sitting there running, not not hard, but over time, it will collect dust. There's oh, a yeah. lot of gunk that gets caught inside of it. Totally. Uh, you, you vacuum your, flo your floor, I hope. You mop your <laughs> yeah, floors, I, I hope. Yeah. You, you, you know, every once in a while, you'll wash your car and even vacuum that, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if... If this is in your home, that stuff's going to get dusty too. There's yes. going to be little, you know. So, yeah, I'm right there with you. Yes. Uh, especially if, if we're talking about our personal computers. Like, if you set it on the floor, chances are it's going to suck up more dust. Yeah. Um, I generally, I like to have them under my desk because they're quieter down there. But yeah. if you have it on top of your desk, there's a little bit less chance that it'll suck up corgi hair, which is my problem that I have. Yeah. Um, but if you start the video, Burke... So I took the opportunity to clean out my PC, and your first uh, reaction might be to, to like take a vacuum or something to yeah, your, your PC, yeah. which is totally not a good idea. You can get create a static charge, which will destroy some of your components. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. No, but as you can see, like inside my PC is pretty dusty. I haven't mm -hmm. cleaned it in about a year. A lot of the dust is going to collect around fans and edges like that. And if you have a filter, Oof. like my... Like, my case comes with a filter that slides into the front, so that yeah. catches a lot of it. Thank God that that's there, because everything else would be worse, <laughs> right? I mean... It would be worse. Like, it, it's already kind of bad in there. It's it's like that dryer sheet moldy, whatever. Oh, yeah, totally. The lint collector. The yeah. The lint collector, yeah. yeah. Um, but what you're going to need is compressed air cans. I have a couple of them because I switched back and forth. I needed, I needed a lot of compressed air for the amount of dust I had in there. But what I like to do when I first start cleaning out the PC is definitely go to a well-ventilated area. So I'm doing this outside. I remove the hard drives, I remove uh, the disk drive, because if I'm using compressed air, I don't want a lot of that stuff getting into a, you know, the hard drive should be safe, but I don't want dust getting into my disk drive. Better safe than sorry. Exactly. And so then I just kind of go around with the compressed there, try and push out as much of the dust with that as I can. You can't get everything. Um, 
resist the urge to use a wet like a wet uh, towel or something like that. So so don't use like diaper wipes or something. Don't <laughs> use diaper wipes. You can use uh, rubbing alcohol if you want to do that. I had on hand one of the little I don't know I guess ha hand wipes you know oh, yeah, that yeah, has yeah, rubbing yeah. alcohol on it. You can use that because that'll evaporate. But don't use water. That's bad for electronics. It's pretty basic. Um, but once you start to wipe down the fan edges, kind of get the the dust off the bottom, spray some of the dust out of the way, and you kind of get it clean that's the opportunity at least for me to start organizing my wires again because mm. uh, I think I've upgraded this computer a couple of times and I you know when I did that I would pull things apart and then I didn't really put it back the way that it should have because I got kind of lazy yeah I saw you had some bread ties in there to kind of keep wires bundled together exactly zip ties are your friends so by Look. the end of it if you're if you do it right you can use as few zip ties as, as you can but like get it to look clean and then by the end of me cleaning it, um, I noticed about 10, 10 degrees Fahrenheit uh, difference from just the idle. Wow. So a wow. pretty big difference. Like I think I was idling around, you know, 100 degrees and then I dropped yeah. it to about, you know, it will idle now around 80, 85. And so I would imagine that that would help with performance and speed and just kind of yeah. make your machine overall peppier and then probably help it last longer too, right? Yes, because heat will kill components. Like it'll kill hard drives, it'll kill a graphics card, uh, CPU and stuff. Like I, you may have seen in that video, like I have a softball, I call it the softball heat sink on my yeah. CPU. And that's yeah. because I do some light overclocking on it, mm -hmm. which generates more heat, but that's what will kill components. And we are in the summer months right now. And if your PC is kind of running crummy or it sporadically crashes or something, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. might be overheating. That might be the issue. So um, definitely open it up and take a look. And actually one of our uh, know-it-alls in the G Plus group reported that something might have been living inside of his oh. PC. Do we have photos of if, this? Yeah, if you open up the link, Burke, uh, Jason Perry on the G Plus shared oh, what was inside of what his is PC. That? Uh, it looks like something was nesting in there. That looks definitely like a rat it, or a mouse was grabbing uh, material and bringing it into yeah, the PC. It's like a teddy bear exploded in there or something. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Yeah, the PC definitely didn't come like that. No. So, And Oof. that is a great way of a fire getting started, yeah. too. So, oh, can you imagine that? Burning down your apartment or home or something? Yes. No, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So regular cleaning out of your PC is is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. I use it as an opportunity to organize my cables and stuff after I'm done with it. And it, I got to give you props, man. <laughs> it looked great. Like you had all your cables bundled together. There wasn't a bunch of loose stuff. Well, like looking pretty streamlined there. As much as it, it scratches my my OCD itch and, and like yeah. aesthetically, I uh -huh. like it when all the cables are lined up and everything. It helps with uh, flow too, uh, mm. airflow. Like mm. good point. Uh, if you imagine air as a fluidic kind of um, material instead of yeah. just like air like you yeah. imagine water if, if it was water or something like yeah, that everywhere through. that there's not something that you can see air is there yeah right? well so it's uh, filling up all those spaces it's filling up all those spaces and you want to clear those areas so if there's a bunch mm -hmm. of cables blocking the front of your cpu fan yeah. or it's like a bunch of cables laying on top of your hard drives that's just space that air can't pass over and yeah. clear the heat away it makes it harder for air to navigate and to move through your pc you want air to flow yeah. using the fluid analogy mm -hmm. So, and like, by the end of when I cleaned my PC, it was actually quieter, too, because nice. the fans didn't have to work as hard to keep the components cool. So now I have my computer on my desk next to me, which generally would bother me because it's, like, a just droning. Yeah. But now that I've cleaned it, it's it's a little bit quieter. It doesn't bother me as much. So, so it's quieter. It's cooler. Mm -hmm. It runs better and faster, and it'll last longer. Like, yep. it sounds like there's no downside. To this. There's no downside. The only thing is, it's a pain because mm -hmm. I mean, I would recommend even too if it's really bad, wearing a mask because uh -huh. that dust uh -huh. can be kind of toxic. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, not what you want to breathe in. No. But at the same time, like, you know, the difference here is just like, just don't be lazy. Just do it, basically. Pretty right. much, pretty much. <laughs> Make it like a yearly routine around the summertime to do it because that's when your PC is uh -huh. going to be the most stressed, um, especially if you live in a home that doesn't have like AC or something like that. Yeah. Like I know you're from like, Phoenix. I'm from Phoenix <laughs> and you got AC, AC everywhere, everywhere right. but you still had, you know, it's also like 
the desert, it's dusty, you bring dust in. I mean, you got to keep your thing as clean. Now I'm in San Francisco where there's no AC, but because of that, we always have our windows open mm -hmm. and my place still gets dusty, you know? Yeah. So it's like whether you're living in the heat or whether you're living <laughs> in the cool, you got to keep it clean, man. Keep you got to keep it clean. Keep it clean, yeah. yeah. No, and, it, you know, I like it just because it makes me uh, organize things again, you yeah. know, tinker with stuff. You know, this reminded me of uh, the stories that we've seen recently with Xboxes and Playstations huh. uh, and what, like bugs and roaches and things yeah. like that that were nesting that inside of it. That were getting of inside of it, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if Burke can find that on the internet and show that, but the reason why that that was happening is because consoles and PCs, as we saw with uh, from the G Plus community there, these are dark, hot places. These are kind of primo breeding grounds for cockroaches. <laughs> it's a place yep. where they're going to want to hang out. It's a place where they're going to want to live. You know, mm -hmm. it's dark. It's kind of like perfect for them. Perfect. And you think about it, you know, like my co consoles are in my TV stand. You right, know what I'm saying? which is already kind of a, a small space. Exactly. Right? My, my PC that I'm using to power my VR headsets, that's like literally located to the left of my TV stand on the ground. I mean, you know, uh, it's 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 perfectly reachable for all of those little <laughs> crawly critters, those creepy yeah. crawly critters. So so that's even one more reason to do this. With that compressed air can, would it be safe to actually like just kind of put that through the little vents in your in your gaming console, or would you really want to deconstruct that as well? Hmm, that's a good question. I think I think as long as you're diligent about cleaning most of the dust that's around your console off, uh -huh, like if you uh -huh. ever see your TV stand getting kind of dusty, yeah. wipe all that down because anything that you don't will probably get more get sucked into your console. Yep. Um, some consoles are easier to take apart than others. Like this I've taken true. apart my fair share of consoles. Like the 360 was a pain in oh, the that butt was the worst. to take apart. And if you took it apart, you can almost never get it back together. And yeah. All creaky yeah. and like not a good look. And the plastic started to get old and brittle and you snap things. And a lot yeah. Of these consoles too, if you take them apart, you yeah. void the warranty on them. Uh, I, I'm fairly certain that my Xbox One is probably filthy inside <laughs> yeah. of it, uh, and that machine gets kind of hot. I, eventually, I will probably take that apart to clean it. And you, same practices, if you do take it apart to clean, compressed air, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, alcohol to to wipe things down. That being said, if you're still under warranty and your stuff's running hot, it's making a bunch of noise, and it's a console, yeah. take it to, back to where you got it from. Take it to you know the Best Buy Geek Squad. Take oh it to, yeah. Uh, whatever. Whatever, and they can take that apart and then figure it out for you without voiding your warranty. So yeah, this video here. <laughs> so I mean, I think generally you'd be okay blowing uh, compressed air into your console to kind of clear it out. Uh -huh. But if you see a bunch of bug bodies in yep, there, I like don't this fellow seeing, yeah, you probably gross. if you use uh, compressed <laughs> air, you're just launching the bodies into the console, yeah. Yeah. so I don't know yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'd recommend that. So terrible. Uh, though I, I really love what you're saying about keeping the environment around your machines clean because where are they gonna get all this stuff from? The environment around your machines. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Now, compressed air, there are some warnings, of course, on the cans and stuff like this. Like, let's talk a little bit about that. It's not the sort of thing you'd wanna like spray like on like, you know, your little brother's face when he's sleeping <laughs> or the sort of no. thing you'd wanna spray on your arm. Like, no. I, you know, now of course, like most people aren't gonna do these things, but let's just talk yeah. about that because it's not That's exactly, there's, you have to be careful with how you use it too. Well, okay, so my, the way I think of using compressed air is very much like the um, the rifle from Halo, short uh -huh. controlled bursts. There you go. Is the best way to do it because if you just hold it down, it will, you know, it'll keep blowing, but it gets weaker and weaker as you hold it down, and you'll might notice that That's the can true. gets really gets cold. Really cold. Yeah. Whenever I use compressed air, I usually grab like a little microfiber cloth or even just like a couple paper towels, whatever, and I mm -hmm. kind of like hold, it's almost like I'm pulling like something out of the oven. This is yeah. the, the, you know, opposite of that because it's <laughs> cold. Right. But it's like, it can get so damn cold that I want to protect my hand. Well, and Which that's, might be a little weird, but I'm, again, better safe than sorry. Yeah, totally. But where you can get in trouble too is you always want to hold it straight up. If yeah. you hold it to the side or you hold it upside down, yes. that's when it, the propellant will get really cold. Yeah. And you'll you'll destroy things if you do that. So always hold it upright mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. facing towards what you want. Don't shoot people with it, no matter how much you might be tempted. Um, there's also... Or yourself. Or yourself. <laughs> hey, did that guy finally clean his Xbox? Or oh, he's gonna open it up. Gross. It still looks pretty dirty. Um, we, okay. <laughs> Skip to the bug part, Berg. Yeah. <laughs> we uh. have so there are so many <laughs> of these videos on the internet, and you know we're showing them to you because they're funny and they're gross. But also, this backs up what he's saying. 
you got to keep it clean. Take care of this stuff. Take you know? care of your electronics, and yeah. they'll take care of you. Yeah. Uh, nasty but, things can be happening. <laughs> <laughs> also, with the, the compressed air, that's why I had two of them. Because yeah. I would use one to do some general spraying, and then once it got kind of cold, and switch it you know, out. Switch to the next one. So. That's smart. That's and just kind of rotate them in and out. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So that's just a way of keeping your, not just your PC, think, think of your, your electronics in general that you might want to keep dust away from. And they'll live longer and they'll be happy. You know? They say electronics don't have feelings, but I'm pretty sure they, they do. And that, that makes them sad if they're, they're too dusty. Yeah, not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. That should uh, wrap up this episode. Uh, we learned PGP and how to mm -hmm. send encrypted emails. And now you're going to keep all your electronics clean out there. Maybe some of you out there have, uh, have some electronics that you've been ignoring that you now should give some attention. Maybe you could submit some before and after photos to our community over at G+. If you go to Google+, and you just search for the know-how community, you can join up. We have 11,000 members there. Take some before and after photos of your disgusting machine and uh, share them there with everyone. It'll be fun. I, I would enjoy to see that, actually. And if you're good at cable management, too, I'd like to see that. Um, yeah. I'm a fan of, of, like, I think there's actually a website where you can go and it's, like, uh, just cable management photos. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, it's, it's kind of... Cable porn, yeah, exactly. It is cable <laughs> porn. I, That's one way you're talking about it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Burke yeah, knows about that? it. I, when you see a nice, nice uh, server rack with all the Ethernets going at same color, yeah. all going the same direction, I don't know it's like Zen for me, like a Zen garden. Oh yeah, definitely. I even like to see it. You know, uh, with uh, my my dad's a super uh, motorhead, and mm -hmm. I'm into cars because I got that sickness from him. And uh, even seeing cars taken apart and seeing a nice cable system. Uh, there's aftermarket stuff, and there's mm -hmm. a company called Painless Wireling. Uh, you know, and you just see it on most cars. You take out the carpets, and there's like cables everywhere, <laughs> yeah. and you know, uh, it 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 it's it's not only pleasing to the eye, but I think it can help you avoid those problems. Like you know, everyone talks about electrical problems as being gremlins. It's like, right. well, which one is it? Why is it this? Why is that? And then you look at the the hairball of cables that like, they've created, and you're like, well, that could be probably it. Probably because it's a mess, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and airflow, airflow matters. So. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. <laughs> uh, but if you want to contact us more directly, or actually, before I get to that, I should say if you want to find any of the, the past episodes we've done or subscribe to the show, go to twit.tv slash kh. You can subscribe to the show. You can download the episode. Um, and if you've ever mess, missed an episode, you can go through our back library of all the other episodes yep. we've worked on. We've had a lot of fun doing this show. We appreciate everyone who watches. And the way you can support us is to subscribe. Uh, but otherwise, if you want to see what we're doing outside of know-how, you want to see how my computer is running, because I'm going to do some light overclocking. Now that I've got a clean PC and I've lowered my temps, I'm going to do a little bit more overclocking, try and nice. squeeze a little bit more performance out of my PC. Um, I'll probably post some results on Twitter, and you can follow me at cranky underscore hippo. And I'm on Twitter at Nate OG. Cool. And then, of course, we couldn't have done the show without him. Burke, thank you for TDing tonight. I know Alex really didn't want to do it, so. <laughs> oh, oh, he's he's going for the mic. You might hear a That's voice. That's funny. This is Alex. Oh, oh. <laughs> lies! Man. This is Burke. This I, is Burke. I don't, maybe I mis mispronounced Alex's name again. <laughs> it's Alex. Well, you do right. do that I, all the time. I do. <laughs> and hey, maybe. Well, I guess Alex hasn't been shaving lately, so him and Burke, they do sit next to each other there. They have the same posture over there. You know, too. it's kind of like when you when people buy a dog and then they're like, oh, the dog looks like the owner. Yeah, I think it's right? basically what Burke and Alex have going on. <laughs> I'm just not sure which one's the dog and which one's the owner. I don't know. But. Maybe they switch off. I All hate right. you both. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should probably end this show before Burke man murders <laughs> us uh, on the air. So now that you know how to encrypt your emails and you know how to clean out your electronics, go do it. Boom. Done. <laughs>